Fire Extraordinaire Karen Sandler to talk about <laughs> GPL enforcement. Wow, that's an awesome introduction. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm Karen Sandler. I'm the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy. This is a uh, uh, no, some, but not all of our projects that are within Conservancy. Um, we are the home of Outreachy, which is exciting. It was mentioned in the previous session. Um, and we're also the home of the um, compliance program for uh, Linux kernel developers who have asked us to enforce their copyrights for them. Raise your hand if you're familiar with our program. So like three quarters of the audience. Raise your hand if you are unsure. Oh, so let me let me get into the, the disclaimers because I am a lawyer, <laughs> so I must have disclaimers. Booze, really? Uh, uh, but I only do legal work now uh, uh, pro bono, so it's only legal work for good. And in my day job, I'm executive director. So I am a lawyer, but this is not legal advice. Not sure why anyone would think it would be, but um, also while I am a lawyer, I am not your lawyer. Um, and I'm trying to split this talk into like a, a half update about what's going on, both with Conservancy's own enforcement and generally with GPL compliance, um, and also uh, with just kind of Q&A so that people can ask uh, uh, you know, questions that they want. Last year, we were, uh, we, Conservancy, conducted feedback sessions at a lot of different conferences to see what folks thought about our compliance initiatives and to find out if they liked what we were doing um, or, um, or wanted us to change. And um, there was so much interest and excitement here last year that I wanted to make sure that I left plenty of time this year so that you could ask whatever questions that you'd like. I would say that when you make a question or a comment, this is being recorded and broadcast. But even if it weren't, make sure that if you're, speak if you're asking a question that you're speaking for yourself or if you're speaking on behalf of a company, that you have the authority to do so. So that you're not like putting your company in an awkward situation by saying something that's uh, uh, in public but also recorded um, if, uh, if that's not appropriate. So just uh, have a quick thought about that. Um, so, uh, so welcome newcomers. So raise your hand if you are you have no idea what I'm talking about when I say GPL enforcement. So like just a few people. So a tiny quick, uh, the quick uh, explanation for that is that um, free and open source software is predicated on licensing. It basically is the idea that we can use copyright to share our work. And so there are different kinds of licenses. And those licenses set the rules by which you can share um, the software. And um, one of the. Um, one of the strategies for licensing is called copyleft because it uses copyright, but to keep things free. And so um, one of the most popular copyleft licenses is called the GPL, the GNU General Public License. Um, there are uh, different iterations of that. Um, and, uh, and what that means is that uh, it, the license basically says in very quick terms, you can do whatever you want with this software, provided that if you if you take the software and make changes and distribute those changes, you do so under the same license. So it's kind of a snowballing forever free approach. In order for that to work, um, it means that there are licensing terms. And, um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, the reason why this holds together is because there are legal mechanisms behind the operation of those licenses so that if someone is not following the rules on that license, someone can say, the, a copyright holder can say, excuse me, wait a minute, you're not following the terms of my license. And if there are legal consequences to that, ultimately, then that means that um, companies and other people who use the licenses are more likely to follow the rules. So uh, that all boils down to the fact that many Linux kernel developers hold their, um, especially from the early days, hold the copyrights to their own code that they have written for the Linux kernel and um, wanted to come together to, um, to help encourage um, companies to follow the rules of the license and to become good actors in the community. And so um, we as Conservancy, as a charitable nonprofit, we're based in the US and we're a charity, uh, provide the service of, of being an enforcement agent and otherwise helping um, kernel developers interface with companies and, um, and others who are out of compliance with their licenses. And um, we do the best we can in a number of ways. And I'll talk about uh, the ways in which we do it. We do it all to promote free and open source software. And that's always our goal, is to promote software freedom. And so every time we engage in the effort of, um, of trying to compel um, violators to follow the license terms, it's with an eye towards 
you know, will, will this action help bring, you know, help free software generally? Will it help more companies come into free software? Um, you know, if we, um, you know, how, how does it look if we, um, if we in, enforce this? Is it going to um, cause more companies to follow the rules because they see that there are consequences to their actions? Um, and how do we choose our actions very carefully? Conservancy is a tiny charity. Um, we have very limited resources, so we also have to be really strategic about the things that we work on. And we try to... Um... Can you hear me still? You can, now I hear the microphone's on again. Um, and so we try to prioritize actions that are either um, where people want to do something with their software, there's real user interest, or, um, or we think that it's uh, strategic in, in some way and will help software freedom overall. Um, and so I will be here um, for the whole week. And if you have questions about this, I'm happy to point you towards newbie resources for the people who raised their hands who didn't know this. It's stuff is fascinating. It's so fun. And I know I'm a lawyer, so it, like maybe I have a distorted view of what's fun. <laughs> like a, a developer turned lawyer is like a really unusual <laughs> combination. But, uh, but I, I promise there's a lot of really interesting stuff in, uh, in there. And so I'm happy to do it. Um, so, uh, uh, some of the things you can't read this wall of text, but uh, but some of the I wanted to update you on what's happened in the last year because there's been a lot of really exciting things that have happened. This is the um, the Linux kernel enforcement statement. Uh, this is a, a a statement that had been in the works for a while. I think um, close to two years actually, and came in various different forms. Um, many uh, different uh, actors in the field, like us, were consulted on early versions of a statement. Um, basically making statements on, um, on the principles of when it's OK to file a lawsuit and when it isn't. How is it appropriate to tell companies that they're out of compliance with their license? We at Conservancy, um, we approach this problem by, uh, by working with the FSF and putting together our, um, uh, writing down our principles of community-oriented license enforcement. Um, and so uh, this has been an, an ongoing effort um, by many different people involved in the Linux kernel. And I think that it's in part related to the fact that uh, there was a, um, a, a kernel developer who had been filing, or who has been filing lawsuits in Germany um, uh, on, um, on the kernel, and, um, and basically uh, in a much more aggressive way and not in a community-oriented way. Um, and so uh, in order to distinguish uh, how the community felt about that, the, um, the TAB, the Technical Advisory Board for the Linux kernel, came together and, um, and helped shepherd this statement, which basically um, adopts one piece of the principles that we at Conservancy and the FSF published. In our principles, we say a bunch of things. Um, we say that um, you know, litigation should be a last resort. Um, we say that it's for the, you know, we're trying to promote the future of free software. But we also say, um, I think it's, I've got two slides forward that I have this, but, um, but we, uh, we also say that what we do when we enforce is we use GPLv3 termination provisions, even on GPLv2 matters. And what that means is that GPLv3 fixed uh, uh, what I consider to be a bug in the second version of the license. Under the second version of the license, if you're in violation of the license, your rights are completely terminated automatically. And that's it. You have to basically you have to get them restored, and the operation of that in different legal jurisdictions possibly works differently. Um, and um, and and so it's a little bit confusing. But automatically under the license, you have no right to distribute the software anymore. Which means that if you have an inadvertent violation, your your right to distribute to sell the products that you already have on shelves goes away. Um, and so under GPLv3, this was fixed by adding a cure per period. So that if you're aware that there's a problem and you fix it quickly, then you, uh, your rights are not terminated. And to me, this is a massive improvement for GPLv3 over GPLv2. But it also just makes sense. Um, a lot of times, there's inadvertent violation of the license. Um, small problems arise, and companies fix it. And that's OK, and that's great. Like, that's, uh, that's how it should work. Uh, we iterate until it's, it's good. And, you know, and, and, and if, when there are mistakes that are, are made, it's not a big deal to have, um, to have a quick correction. Um, but uh, under GPLv2, there are serious consequences for that. And so what we do is we promise that no matter what, even if we're dealing with a GPLv2 uh, violation, which is usually the case with the Linux kernel, um, then we, um, we, we treat it as if there were this cure period. 
So, um, and you know, we, we provide these nicer terms because today's, the company that's violating the license today is tomorrow's contributor, right? If they can understand how these licenses work, why it's so beneficial to industry, why they're going to be, why it's helping their business, they'll be more likely to, to sign on. And if we're um, kind with the way that we approach companies with, um, with violations, then they're more likely to become contributors and everybody wins. And it's kind of a magical thing. And so the, um, the Kernel community came together and adopted that piece of the principles, say, basically committing that for them, per, for each of the people who have signed on to this um, enforcement statement, they've committed to, um, to also following GPLv3 termination provisions, the gentler termination provisions, um, even on, um, on v2 with the kernel. Um, and it was a, it's, a, it's a very interesting um, uh, uh, thing, and I could really geek out legally over it because people argue I, it looks, it's, a, it's, it's an additional permission and, um, and state and, and couch this stuff, but there's people who, are, who talk at great length over what the legal ramifications are for it, and um, I, won't, uh, I won't bore you with that. But again, hallway talk, fascinating to discuss. <laughs> um, so, uh, and so this is very exciting for us because we're trying to promote the, um, the full principles of community-oriented GPL enforcement. Um, there are quite a number of things in the, um, in the principles that are, um, uh, are, are beneficial to our community if everybody follows them when they decide to make sure that people follow the license on the code that they, have, they own the copyrights to. Um, and, um, and we have even had now companies sign on to the, uh, the um, principles wholesale. And the principles were very useful, for example, for the NetFilter team to help distinguish um, you know, the, the values of um, their community versus um, uh, someone who is trying to enforce the license for monetization. So, um, so uh, these are sort of all of the principles that we have, or most of them that we have codified in, those, uh, in that document, um, including things like we check violations before we complain about them. We make sure that there's really something to complain about and that um, we, we don't prioritize financial gain, uh, that compliance is our ultimate goal. And of course, that legal, legal action is a last resort. And so uh, it's very exciting to us that the kernel community adopted a piece of these, um, these principles, and I think it's very impactful. When the, uh, the developers that have signed it, most of them have signed on to the uh, kernel enforcement statement as individuals, but some of them have also signed on on behalf of their companies, uh, which I think is, is really cool. And then at the state, like right after that happened, the um, four companies came out with their own promise, their own kind of covenant around the GPL, also adopting V3 termination provisions on V2. And that included Facebook, Google, IBM, and Red Hat, also adopting this, uh, this piece. Um, it's uh, limited to, um, to only not, and, and the kernel enforcement statement is as well, limited to um, uh, non-defensive action, uh, but still, I think, a really great step in the right direction. And this is a major um, development in the enforcement compliance space over the last year. Um, also, uh, raise your hand if you follow the DJI drones thing. So like a few of the people who I would expect to, uh, but uh, but, uh, but so uh, so this was a uh, uh, this person um, John Sawyer tweeted that he had asked this drone company for the source on GPL code in the, in, a, in, in, a, in a drone that uh, that they had bought and uh, and the company did not after a couple of iterations had not provided the source code and so uh, and so John Sawyer went and uh, published a root exploit for their product, uh, which uh, really brought a lot of attention to um, GPL compliance and how frustrated developers get when they know they should have access to the code, but it's, made, it's still unavailable to them. Um, now, uh, this, of course, caused a lot of dis like, caused discussion. We have uh, Conservancy maintain a discussion list for our principles because while we have the principles of community-oriented GPL enforcement, we have to understand that uh, we, we really embrace the fact that we don't necessarily, uh, we're, we, we don't necessarily, are, we're not necessarily the arbiters of, of, of what is a, a principled way to enforce and that people might disagree. And so we've created, a, we, as soon as we publish them, we create a discussion list to discuss whether or not uh, we should add anything to the principles or if anything was misstated. And of course, this sp uh, spawned a bit of a discussion about, um, about whether, um, whether we needed to 
amend the principles to deal with publishing exploits uh, to retaliate against uh, GPL violators, which is really interesting. And I think um, the principles, I think, already address it because we, uh, we talk about confidentiality being OK um, and the idea that we are trying to bring uh, violators in as, as, uh, as contributors. And so it's a, it's a, it's a balancing act. But, um, but I think that's one of the major things that happened this year uh, recently, too. As for conservancy's enforcement, and I'm sorry that I'm racing so much, but I want to leave time to, answer, to talk about whatever it is that you want me to talk about. Um, we've been slowly chugging along. Um, as I said, we're not very, we're, we're a really small organization, so it's, there's quite limited on the things that we can work on, and we have quite a few open matters, but um, companies really delay us. They love to just say, yeah, we'll get back to you in three weeks. We're doing, you know, um, we're going to research that, and you know we want to give companies the fullness of time, but uh, but it's clear in some cases that they are simply just delaying us, which is I think the most common strategy. Uh, when uh, we uh, at Conservancy funded Christoph Helwig's lawsuit against VMware, uh, we went public with the fact that it had been four years where we've been trying to get VMware into compliance with. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and, and it's, worth, it's worth it to take the fullness of time to give companies the chance to do the right thing and to give them the benefit of the doubt. But I think some companies saw that and realized that that was a strategy um, and so have been actively delaying us, which has been difficult. Um, uh, another thing that happened with Conservancy's enforcement is that uh, a, a company has joined the coalition, which I think is very interesting. Um, I think small consulting companies uh, realize that their, um, their bread and butter is through compliance and that if uh, there isn't good compliance and that nobody is uh, making sure that there's compliance across the industry, then they're the ones that really suffer because they can't, um, they can't be a meaningful player. Um, we're also seeing, and, uh, and this uses a term that was coined by my coworker Bradley Kuhn, we're seeing an increase in savvy violators. So when I first started working in this field, we, it was quite common where we would see a, a product with, we, you know, we call it no source or offer, right? They had no source code and they don't offer for the source code, which is what the GPL requires. And we would contact those companies and often they, those companies had just didn't realize they had obligations. And they, um, you know, it was somewhat easy to kind of bring them into compliance. We would have discussions, a lot of first principles discussions, we would wind up recommending that they hire lawyers and point them to resources, uh, recommend that they talk to the Linux Foundation or other companies that, or entities that are out there to help companies get familiar with, um, with free and open source software. But what we're seeing now is many more companies that know exactly what they're doing. So they're either, they either um, have made a calculated risk that this isn't something they need to worry about because there's been so little, um, so few lawsuits in the field, um, or they, um, they, uh, they have gone as far as they think they need to before somebody asks them to do any more. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I'd say it's been a real change over the last five years from where things had been before. Pretty much in the past when you had contacted a company, you could pretty much assume that if, you, did, if you, you weren't already in touch with them, you pretty much assumed that they just needed to be educated. But that's not necessarily the case anymore. Um, and, uh, and it's very frustrating because it's dealing with a different kind of, of problem. Um, another thing that we're seeing is the powerful vendor. So a lot of companies have strong relationships with their vendors. And their vendors are the ones that are not following the rules on the license. And they haven't provided the source code to their product to their customer, and then their customer is packaging that software into their product, and then that product is, um, is being sold. And so the, the violator, from our perspective, or from, from any user's perspective, or any meaningful way, is the company that's make, creating the product and putting it on the market, but really they're a victim of the GPL, of a, of a GPL violation themselves. And they don't have access to the source code, so they can't even go and, and you know, they can't even fix the violation even if they wanted to. But they're so worried about the relationships with their vendors because they rely on them to get to market. And so um, it, it, it results in this really interesting dance where companies desperately try to protect their vendors rather than turn on, or turn on them or try to get them into compliance. They get into this very defensive, protective um, um, mode. And that's been very interesting. And we've been trying to think of creative solutions to help uh, ameliorate this, including things like signing a document that says that the you know the software they got was uh, you know 
was not um, sufficient. They would have liability, but we wouldn't uh, exercise the, the uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't hold them to it because we know that they're really not the ones. And, and what's interesting is that um, because there's been so much, finally, there's so much interest in security um, uh, around software generally, um, I'm finding that when I talk to lawyers at companies, I'm having a much better result of advocating that lawyers ask for all of the source code um, and the scripts to control compilation installation from all of their vendors, just asking for it as a matter of course, even if it's proprietary software, because if they have a security vulnerability down the road, how else are they going to ever possibly deal with it unless they have access to the source code themselves? And so that is finally starting to have some traction. So I have a lot of hope about this um, and, and hope that the industry will move and we'll have the, the problem. Of course, the problem with the powerful vendor and also these other problems is that it all results in proprietary kernel modules. So even when we are able to get, uh, get, like even when there's not a savvy violator, even when we're able to take care of most of the problems of compliance, where we're able to, to get uh, you know, source candidates and study them and make sure that they're, um, they're complete and corresponding, even when we're able to do that, they often result in pieces of the code that are, you know, we, we, we bump up against proprietary kernel modules, even to the point where we see companies patching export symbol GPL, which is, fascinating and shocking and deeply upsetting. So uh, uh, I'm, I want to wrap this, the presentation part up, but I wanted to say a little something about um, corporate versus individual copyrights. So historically, with the Linux kernel and other free and open source software, the projects have their origin in individuals creating useful software projects that then becomes adopted by companies. And, uh, and the Linux kernel had its roots um, in, in that manner, and it, it created a really interesting licensing dynamic. Um, and individuals had, um, had a lot of power, they had a lot of influence into the direction of the project. And due to the success of the Linux kernel, and this is a really good thing, companies became very invested in the Linux kernel and other free and open source software that's copy left, um, became really invested in the software, and many of the developers became employed by those companies, which is a great result. Um, some of those individuals managed to negotiate them keeping the copyrights to their own code. Um, but that has been declining over time. And Jonathan Corbett and LWN have published an analysis over time of individual versus corporate contributors um, to the kernel. And you can see, and you know, there's, there's a lot of question marks as to what those numbers are really referring to based on what email addresses people use and things like that. But it definitely points to the indication that there are fewer individuals contributing to the kernel. Um, and this is significant because we have such a beautiful balancing act with copyleft software, with really useful copyleft software that industry relies on and that we use. Um, the Linux kernel, in particular, is just this exceptional piece of software. We have this amazing collaboration around uh, the Linux kernel, and a lot of it comes from its origins of being copy left, of the ideas around sharing being codified in licenses that have consequences if they're not followed. And so uh, what's interesting is as we shift to a situation where more companies are in control, it means that, uh, that the power dynamic becomes off. And, uh, and so this is a very touchy subject for me to talk about in a public way. Um, and, and I see some people nodding and smiling in the audience. Um, and I will say that, uh, that there are a lot of entities that really don't want me to, <laughs> really don't want anyone to talk about this question um, because it is, it is really a balancing act. Free and open source software works great because we, are, we as a community are in control. But when we don't exercise our control or our power, we cede a lot of control to companies, which means we lose a lot of the benefits of free and open source software. One of the reasons why it's so fabulous to be a Linux kernel developer is you can walk from one company to another. Right? You have a lot of freedom to go from one job to the next. And again, I see lots of people nodding here. Like a lot of times if people are in different jobs doing exactly the same thing. And they're in control because they get to work on what they love. And they, one of the reasons why that's so that's so possible is because copy left in the GPL is a real equalizer. And without having real compliance, if we are not standing up for it, then we lose that. We lose that benefit. And suddenly, there's something a little bit less special about the Linux kernel. We may not have the kind of collaboration we've had in the past. And so 
one of the things that we're doing at Conservancy is working on this thing called Contract Patch, which is to help developers better negotiate their employment agreements. And I would encourage individuals to, um, to think about negotiating, keeping your own copyrights, and also advocating for a copyleft because it gives so much power towards ethical technology, towards sane technology, but also towards uh, making sure that we have this great collaboration in an ongoing way. Um, and I'll even go a little bit further and say that because some of these messages are, um, have mixed reception from the companies that have interest in this space, I think it's in the industry's long-term interest for us to have strong copy left. But on short-term short -term profit motivations, it's not necessarily as clear. And so companies are very hesitant about some of these messages that I think they have benefited from for so long. And so uh, I would say that it's increasingly difficult to find spaces to have this conversation. And this conference is really special because it's community organized. And it's one of the few places where you can talk about these kinds of issues now where you don't have the microphone being controlled by an entity that is driven by corporate interests. And so that's really special. And I would say that I really want to thank Andrew and the Colonel Minicon, like all of you for coming, because this is a, a, a really special thing. And the idea that I can now say, ask me whatever you want, is really exciting. So please, ask me. Well, let's actually give Andrew a round of applause before Thank you. So we have, we still have 15 minutes, I think. Yes, um, we've got 15 minutes till the next talk, although in 10 oh. minutes, uh, I have scheduled a break time for people to leave if they want to go to other mini conferences. Okay, 10 minutes. So just a quick question. Um, so my area is definitely in the Linux kernel, and you used a lot of examples around the kernel for violations. Can you give a feel for how many other projects you actually have to advocate for as well? Oh, other than the Linux kernel? Yes. Yeah, so uh, within Conservancy, we, uh, we do uh, enforcement for any of our member projects that ask us to. So um, we've done uh, uh, enforcement for, I'd say, like five different projects within Conservancy, uh, Inkscape, um, Samba, um, uh, QEMU. Um, and then also we have the Debian uh, copyright aggregation project where um, Debian developers have assigned their uh, some of them have assigned their copyrights to us. And actually, some kernel developers have also assigned their copyrights to us. But predominantly, we have enforcement agreements in place. Um, and I would also say that I forgot to say that, uh, that uh, anyone who holds their own copyrights um, or companies that hold their own copyrights can sign up for the uh, kernel coalition. And when you're a part of our coalition, uh, you have input into whatever we do. So we don't take any large actions without having a big discussion amongst all of our copyright holders, which is, I think, uh, pretty useful. Um, and some people uh, uh, just enjoy being a part of that uh, discussion. And we don't um, take any action on anyone's copyrights without consulting with you first. So uh, it's also possible to sign up with the coalition um, anonymously. Uh, I would also note, and it makes me a little sad that I have to say this, that this is not solicitation. <laughs> Uh, that, that someone had said, you're soliciting, which the lawyers can't do, uh, but, uh, but I am not for hire. You can't hire me as your lawyer, <laughs> uh, and I'm not charging for this, and the services that we're providing are, are primarily uh, are, are non-legal, and you can take a look at our, all of our agreements are public, so feel free to take a look. Okay, so oh, here, and then we'll get to you. Cool, thanks. Um, I'm interested in a kind of morbid, morbidly fascinated way in the sort of savvy uh, and the corporate abusers that are deliberately slowing things down. And I'm remembering a case, I think, from a couple of years ago where there was a large um, Android uh, co hardware company that produced... that. Uh, the company was saying, no, 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 no GPL from us. And then suddenly a whole bunch of things turned up from some random developer that just happened to suit exactly what they, you know, they had been talking about. Do you get a feeling that the resistance in those companies is from just from the, the lawyers or the CEOs or is it from the, or is it from the developers or the whole stack? I think it's a combination. Like, I think that... Um 
in some of the major companies in our space, the uh, companies have the in-house counsel have done a really tight analysis on the legal and like the legal risks associated with um, with proprietary kernel modules in particular. Um, and they have their legal analysis, and then they have their risk analysis. And I think that uh, I think that it, with respect to the savvy violators, I think the in-house counsel are giving the products team tools. And so I think they think they're going to have an edge if they hold back as much as possible, which, you know, I, from a software freedom perspective and from a technology perspective, it doesn't make any sense in the long run. But it does give you, like, that short-term edge. And especially as products are end-of-lifing quickly, they, they think that that's a really uh, smart way to go. So it's really a combination. I mean, from what I've seen, especially the kinds of developers that hang out at, like, free software events and that we interact with, um, they are horrified at what their companies are doing. And we've had really awful situations where people have felt like they needed to whistleblow. And so you know, developers would pass us little pieces of paper with their product numbers on them and be like, investigate those. And it's like, you know what? You are probably violating your employment agreement. <laughs> like, just take a deep breath and try to go in, like, internally do it. You know, don't tell me anything. I am not, you know, like, like saying that formulation of I'm not your lawyer is like the biggest understatement, you know? It's like, you know, you need to deal with your own obligations. And, you know, I, I think about the Volkswagen situation quite often where they were hiding their emissions. Um, and I think that, like, what an awful corporate culture. And I think that if, and, and I'm going to talk more about this in my talk on Wednesday, but I think if technologists and developers in particular were a little bit more willing to stand up and ask tough questions and be in uncomfortable situations where, you know, you don't even have to put your foot down or quit or anything, you just have to say, hey, you know, the right thing to do is to, you know, to, to and, and I think if they engage a little bit more also in the business model of, you know, this seems like we're going to get the short-term advantage, but our product is going to be healthier in the long run, we'll have an ecosystem, et cetera. So there is this person. I thought Paul was going to ask my question with his morbid fascination bit, but uh, have you had anyone ask about, for, for advice for filling out a will uh, and copyright assignment, and are there any international differences and ramifications for that sort of thing? So I totally gave a talk on this at last year's LCA. <laughs> uh, so you can check out the video. Uh, it turns out that uh, in some jurisdictions you can bequeath, uh, you can bequeath your, your copyrights, but in a lot of jurisdictions it doesn't work out. And so uh, what I'm working on is sort of like uh, more springing rights and establishing a trust where you can, uh, you can grant rights to the trust and then, or grant, you can assign your copyright to the trust and then, um, and then they grant back to you a license to use it however, you know, however you really need to use it, but they hold the copyrights and then when you die, the li they, they already hold the copyrights. Because otherwise what happens in some places, you have to be really careful because if you uh, bequeath a copyright and it, it, it can trigger in some places uh, an evaluation where a, um, you have to get someone to do an analysis about the fair market value of that copyright and it pass, you know, and so then taxes are assessed on your, um, on your estate, which then means less money going to your, um, your heirs. So you gotta be really careful with that. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, in regards to the bit about individual versus corporate, corporate copyrights, um, have you seen recently, uh, because there's recently been quite a large increase in CLAs, especially for, um, you know, corporate projects that become open source, um, do you, is this a thing you think will become more of a problem in the future? Well, it's interesting. So I thought that the days of individuals holding their copyrights, especially as they work for employers, were coming to a close. Uh, or, or at least diminishing, but I taught a continuing legal education class to a whole bunch of lawyers that were active in this space. It was kind of a packed room, and half of them said that they had worked on employment agreements for companies allowing their employees to hold their own copyrights. So, um, so I think that as more and more developers ask to keep their own copyrights, I think that more companies will allow it because then it becomes a recruitment technique. And so if everybody asks for it, even if you don't get it and you say, okay, well, I wasn't really expecting that anyway, so I'm going to sign this agreement, I'm going to take the job I really wanted, companies realize that the, you know, lots of developers are asking for it and it might compel a shift. And, and I think that you know, some, some folks are consulting and they hold their own copyrights anyway. So. 
Do you think that education at university level of upcoming engineers would help to change this because of the lack of like education around ethics and copyright and things like that? Like even asking employers, do you think this is something that is well, given your reaction, yes, this is, but. Definitely, so uh, last week I spoke at QSEC, which is a Canadian conference organized by uh, uh, software, uh, by computer engineering students. And, uh, and they asked me to speak about technology ethics. And it was like thousands of, it was really cool. Um, and it made me realize that we in the free software movement, we who are all concerned about ideology. Um, we used to spend a lot of time at universities and I think a lot of us have stopped doing that and we absolutely have to pick that up again. It's the most important thing we can do. We also need, as free software projects, we need to engage more students. Um, you know, uh, Conservancy runs outreachy. A lot of the, out you don't have to be a student to be an outreachy the way that Google Summer of Code is structured, but, uh, but a lot of our participants are students. Um, having those mentor relationships with, uh, with students and helping them find ways to make free and open source software parts of their um, academic program is huge. Um, and, and I agree, so was, I got mobbed after my talk by like 20 students who, or who, all of whom were like, I hadn't thought about this, this is, you know, someone was like, because I gave my medical devices talk and, uh, and, uh, and one of them was like, I'm going to become a bio, like, a biotech double major and I was like, yeah, we'll see if any of you do any of the things that you're saying that you're going to do. But, but even if just a few, just, if, if just to get them thinking about it is, is important, so absolutely. And everyone here should take the time to go and talk to some students. What advice do you have for employees of companies whose vendors are not compliant? I fear that having a non-compliant vendor could be an argument by people who are so inclined not to publish an offer of source for your own product. Yes, that was, that was one of the things that I was talking about earlier. We're seeing that quite a lot. It's because you're, and, and, and so what I'm trying to do there is trying to educate uh, in-house counsel so that companies make policies about uh, exercising their GPL, um, you know, uh, exercising their offers for source uh, at the time of the negotiation. Um, because often what happens is the reliance on that vendor happens over time and then, you know, once the product's already in place and then going back to that vendor and demanding the source code for, so that they can be compliant with their own product becomes a lot less viable because they're so reliant on that vendor and they've gone out of their, they've already designed their product around that vendor's software. So this is a real problem that we see all the time. Um, and what we find interesting is that a lot of companies are even willing to dig in their heels to protect their vendors because they don't, it will be so expensive for them to, uh, to strip that software out of their product. So my, my advice is to engage with legal early because I think that one, as soon as the product is in the, on the market, there's the negotiation and power is gone. That negotiation has to happen before the vendor is, on, is under contract. And therefore, legal needs to be made aware of this like before they get to that point. Is, have you given any consideration to pursuing um, zombie companies to find out to, 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 to get the copyrights that have been assigned to them. Um, my, my situation is that, in common with quite a few people in this room, I think, I, I worked for Linux Care back in 2000. I don't know which of its corporate successors would still hold the copyrights that they own as a result of paying my salary during that time, but it, it might be possible to get some of those copyrights at uh, fire sale values. Wow, that's an interesting idea. I mean, you know, I, I think from our perspective, I'm not, we would, I think we would have a, we, the enforcement coalition is stronger and stronger the more copyrights that we have. That is undeniable. But at the same time, I want to make sure that the actions that we're taking reflect the wishes of folks that are, have written the code and that are engaged with it and trying to pursue zombie companies. I don't know, I'll have to think about it, but it feels kind of like a little bit in bad faith to me. Like they're not, no longer a player. And so does it make sense to have those copyrights at play? I mean, it seems like a little bit like you're bordering on trollish activities to go and try to incorporate those copyrights. Now, on the other hand, if we acquire them, then it kind of neutralizes them. So they're not acquirable by somebody else who's going to maybe try to monetize them. So there's that. Um, but I'll have to think about it. That's an interesting thing. I think we're out of time. We are out of time. Um, everyone, please thank Karen Sandler.